soy and isoflavones. So let me just give a brief outline. And if you see a comparison between uh, soy uh, proteins and uh, you know different types of animal-based proteins, like you can compare a soybeans uh, with boiled eggs, and you can see the difference is that in boiled eggs, you have high amount of saturated fat, while uh, for soybeans, you have polyunsaturated fat. Cholesterol is high, sodium is high, dietary fiber is zero as far as eggs are concerned. While here you can see everything is uh, in the right required quantity. Yes, vitamin D is present in the uh, eggs, but which is not there in soybeans. Otherwise, you can see the calcium concentration and iron and potassium uh, is pretty much great with soybeans. A similar comparison you can do between paneer and tofu. And you can see the same pattern followed again, high saturated fats, uh, cholesterol, sodium is high, no dietary fibers. Again, if you compare cow milk with soy milk, again, you will see the similar pattern. So you can see that soy milk as a protein uh, is a pretty good, uh, you know, option for us to have. It's probably the best plant-based source of protein, low saturated fat. It has both essential fatty acids. It is low carb with low glycemic index, zero cholesterol, low sodium, and a fair amount of fiber as well. Right, it has a lot of vit minerals and vitamins, and most of them are more than 10% of the daily allowance, which is recommended. Uh, there has been some controversy about the presence of phytates and oxalates in these plant proteins, and yes, they do reduce the uh, absorption to an extent, but still, studies have shown that calcium absorption from soy was found to be comparable to that of dairy milk. So, it's not like practically it is having much of a difference. Now, coming to the main crux of the uh, problem, polyphenols and isoflavones. Now, what are these? Now, polyphenols are basically antioxidants which are found in plant foods, right? And as other antioxidants, they neutralize the harmful free radicals and reduce inflammation. Now, there are more than 8,000 types of polyphenols. Various categories are there. Currently, what we are going to talk about is isoflavones. Now, these are structurally similar to estrogen. Hence, they are called as phytoestrogens. Now, they bind to both types of estrogen receptors, that is ER alpha and ER beta. But uh, while estrogen acts equally on both, isoflavones prefer the ER beta. And because of these differences, there are uh, you know, different actions and sometimes even opposite effects which are found uh, as far as soy is concerned. And the isoflavones are the ones that provide the many health benefits of soy-based foods. Now, a single serving of soya contains around 25 milligrams of isoflavone. What is important to note is that if you refine the product too much, like if you take isolated soy protein, even 80 to 90 percent of the isoflavone content can be lost. And uh, you will have many studies which will have very different results. What you have to understand is the results differ based on the type of study, whether it's animals or humans, the reliability of the data the existing hormone levels of the patients who are being evaluated, whether they are premenopausal, postmenopausal, and even the type of soy which has been studied. Now, based on this, let us see what are the prominent effects that are known. Now, it is very clear that uh, soy protein lowers the LDL cholesterol and increases HDL level. Uh, in fact, 25 grams of soy protein per day reduces LDL, HDL by 3% and triglycerides by 4%. If you look at diabetes, in theory, they can help lower insulin resistance, reduce blood, sh blood sugars, and inhibit oxidative stress. But few studies have failed to find a strong link between the two. As far as heart disease and strokes are concerned, they are known to reduce inflammation in blood vessels and improve their elasticity. Right? So they do lower the risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke by 15 to 20%. And hypertension also, they have shown that they lower the BP by 3 to 6 uh, milligrams of mercury in hypertensive patients. Although this amount seems to be small, but this itself can reduce the risk of stroke and CVD further. And blood vessels, we mentioned, studies have shown that they improve the endothelial function as well as reduce the arterial stiffness. If you look at the bone health, then soy fruits are known to promote bone health in postmenopausal women and even improve the uh, bone marrow density. Uh, as far as breast cancer is concerned, there was this large study conducted in Chinese women, which are followed for uh, up to 13 years. 
and uh, it showed that there was a significant lower risk with intakes of soy. And if they start taking in adolescents, the risk is even further reduced. And prostate cancer, they, we have basically not uh, many RCTs, but observational and case control cohort studies. And all have indicated that those with soy intake have a lower incidence of prostate cancer. Uh, in the renal effect, in pre-dialysis patients, soy proteins has been found to decrease serum creatinine, serum phosphorus, protein urea, and inflammation, but it did not really affect the glomerular filtration rate. Uh, if you look at postmenopausal symptoms, then uh, the meta-analysis of RCTs have shown that isoflavones reduce the frequency by 20% and the severity by 26%. That is definitely a very significant finding. Even for memory and cognition, uh, you know, a low estrogen in menopausal women, the theory is, uh, can reduce the receptors in the brain and that can affect the memory and learning in postmenopausal conditions. So if fermented soy products have shown benefits uh, in cognitive decline, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease although the data is not sufficient enough to make any specific recommendations. There have been studies where uh, depression, since it has been found to have a higher prevalence in females and in a postmenopausal uh, period, uh, three months of 100 milligrams per day of isoflavones have found to reduce symptoms in clinically depressed women. Even skin health, these isoflavones have shown to have a significant benefit as far as facial skin wrinkling, discoloration, and overall or appearance is concerned. In children, I already mentioned that if you start early, the risk of breast cancer is shown to be lesser, and it does reduce the LDL cholesterol level as well. Uh, fertility is a big uh, point of debate, which is always there, but women with higher intakes of soy flavones were shown, shown to have up to one and a half times greater chances of giving birth. Men did not show any similar benefits, but no adverse effect also was found on sperm concentration or uh, quality of uh, the sperms. And uh, the, a big uh, thing is made about male uh, feminization uh, reports, but apparently there have been just two case reports which have been published, and those people had consumed like 360 milligrams per day of isoflavones. That's nine times the what is recommended. And uh, many reviews subsequently have found no effects on uh, of such things. Uh, Meta-analysis of RCTs have uh, shown that TSH was slightly raised, but no effect on actual thyroid hormone uh, production was found. Uh, there was fear that isoflavones could increase the risk of endometrial cancer, but uh, there is enough data which has shown that they do not uh, do that. So to conclude, uh, soy foods provide high quality proteins, the good source of essential fatty acids. The distinctive aspect is high isoflavones. They can be safely consumed by all individuals unless of course somebody is allergic to soy, which is relatively uncommon. And always we should choose whole foods over processed soy foods. There is solid evidence that it reduces cholesterol, LDL, lowers BP, elevates hot flashes and improves arterial health. Mild evidence for reduction in risk of breast and prostate cancer and no evidence towards any untoward effects seen in postmenopausal women or in men. As far as how much intake should be there, uh, up to 25 grams per day of soy protein or 50 milligrams per day of soy isoflavones, which basically equates to roughly two servings of soy products per day should be safe enough to take. Thank you so much. And this was the this is a very nice article for those who want to read in more detail uh, of each health aspect of uh, isoflavones and soy proteins. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, from from your answer, it seems that uh, the soy is more advantageous than uh, rather than harmful for health. But uh, we also would like to know. A tutor me for such thoughts on the same topic. Sir, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitesh. It's an honor to be here and honor to be speaking along with uh, Dr. Sharan. Um, it was so comprehensive, Dr. Covered all of those studies and shared the evidence. Thank you so much for that. Um, now that we've understood that soya protein has so much of evidence that it's beneficial and not harmful. 
I'd like to share a little bit on the practical side about um, a few experiences with my life, with my patients, and with uh, how to include these soy proteins in your diet. Um, my uh, journey in plant-based nutrition, it started when my mother fell sick. Uh, she had a condition called DUB or dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And for this, she was given hormone replacement therapy. Um, she underwent the therapy multiple cycles of it. Every time she took the drugs, the bleeding would stop. And then when she stopped the medicines, once again, the bleeding would restart. It got so bad that when she was lying down on the bed, her head would spin and she couldn't even get up. And despite all of the medications that she was taking, but finally, when she switched to a healthier diet and lifestyle, in just one month, the bleeding stopped, the uh, dizziness stopped, her uh, H, you know, hemoglobin improved back to normal, and she was on, she, she had flown to Sharjah, she was trekking there um, and um, doing all the projects that she wanted to do. It was an amazing transformation. The reason I'm sharing this is because a few years later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And we know from evidence that hormone replacement therapy might increase the risk for breast cancer in some women. And if I had known about the benefits of um, you know, of soya beans and of other food plant foods, and if she had made that change before, avoided that hormone replacement therapy, who knows, her risk might have reduced. It's not just about, is it good for me or is it bad for me? The question we also need to ask ourselves is what's the alternative? There are so many women who suffer from menopausal symptoms. Um, bleeding, heavy bleeding is one of them. Uh, you have hot flashes, you have um, you know, tiredness, dizziness, fatigue, so many other symptoms. And soya beans seem to help with a lot of those symptoms to a significant extent. It even reduces risk of several cancers um, like endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, while taking estrogen drugs as supplements can actually increase the risk of many of these cancers in many cases. Um, it helps to strengthen your bones, it helps to keep your kidneys safe, it helps to um, you know, reduce risk of breast cancer, whether you're young or old, whether you've had uh, you know, breast cancer or not yet had breast cancer. In all those cases, it seems to reduce the risk, which is why after her first uh, diagnosis. She went through treatment, chemotherapy, and surgery and radiation. The doctor was surprised at how well and how quickly she recovered. And after that, they made sure that she consumed soya in some form every day on a regular basis, whether it's soya milk or tofu or tempeh or just cooked soya beans. Um, most of the days, what we do is we grind the soya beans into a flour and put it in the idli or the dosa or chapati or just put it in sambar, make sambar powder out of the soya beans and just use it in some form, like one or two spoons or half a cup a day um, in, in some dish or the other. And that quantity is more than enough for you to get all of the benefits. Like Dr. Sharan said, when you consume it in small quantities on a regular basis, one or two servings a day, you get those benefits. But when you increase it more than that, researchers found that when you eat five or more servings of soya beans, your secretion of IGF-1 goes up. IGF-1 is insulin-like growth factor 1. And this hormone is actually responsible for triggering cancer growth in your body, which you don't want. The whole point of eating soya beans is to stay healthy. You don't want to increase your cancer risk. So definitely not more than five servings a day. But less than that, two, three servings a day, one or two servings a day is perfectly safe and very easy to consume in all of these various forms as well. Think of a tofu curry, a tempeh curry. You can put tofu in your sub cheese. You can put it in your chapati. You can grind it and make a cheese out of it. You can use soya flour in your chapatis, idlis, dosas. You can um, cook it with, you know, with water to make like a kadi or a pitla. You can... Um, what else? You can make baked pakodas or baked vadas using soya beans. You can use soya milk instead of milk. Just a drink like that itself. You can put it in smoothies. You can make curds from soya milk. You can um, make ice cream. You can make uh, 
it, the list is endless. Use it for your beverages. Uh, so many, many different uses. It's so versatile and it's so delicious, especially if you're trying to reverse, um, say, reduce your cholesterol levels. Then soya milk is a fantastic alternative for milk. And especially if you're cooking oil free, then using soya milk can help you to get that fatty, rich flavor without increasing your cholesterol levels adversely. So I hope that helped. Thank you so much for coming. And it was a pleasure speaking with you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing the insights and also for sharing the inspiring story of your mother. Uh, does anyone uh, uh, else want to add uh, to whatever the speakers have said? I'm asking other speakers. I can just uh, add one more point is that the estrogen, uh, you know, the mimicry which is there and it's a lot of misconceptions are there. Uh, the effect of phytoestrogens is much less as compared to that of the normal estrogen. That is why when they go and bind to those receptors, they don't actually act like estrogen. They in fact can reduce the uh, estrogen uh, action. But that also depends on whether it is pre-menopausal or post-menopausal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, actually, I just wanted to say something about soya bean. We are currently doing a, a cholesterol lowering intervention project and it's just coming to an end. So soya bean was one of the main components. So we included around four servings of soya bean uh, along with the other components uh, similar to portfolio diet. And we are seeing a good reduction in cholesterol, almost around 30% in one month duration. That's great. That's a great point. Uh, anybody else? Uh, okay. Uh, Vinay, ma'am, you can continue with the next question. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so the second question goes to Sharan, sir, again. Uh, according to some past studies, it was suggested that proteins can lead to breast cancer. Yet today, the health industry supports daily uh, protein intake. Do proteins actually play a significant role in the development of cancer or are they merely bystanders in the process? Also, what is the recommended daily pro protein consumption for post-chemotherapy uh, patients? Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer this. And Dr. Varsha, who is unfortunately not able to come, uh, would have been a better person to take this on. Uh, what I can talk about, though, uh, is, uh, you know, the whole concept of protein and how, uh, how much protein has been promoted. See, protein is uh, undoubtedly one of the important macronutrients which is there and we need it. But if you look at the RDA, the recommended daily allowance, it is around 0.8 uh, you know, grams per kg which roughly comes to around uh, 60 grams per day. Now, that is also, we have to understand, it is two standard deviations above the average. So an average person in a normal bell curve would require around 0.66 grams per kg per day. 50% of the population would even require less than 0.66. 50% would require more. But just to be safe, we are keeping a, point, a 0.8 uh, level which is above, which will cover roughly 97% of the entire population. So beyond that, most studies have shown that beyond that, if you increase the protein uh, intake, it's not going to give you any additional benefit. Yes, we have to reach that much of protein, but we don't have to go necessarily beyond that. Unless, of course, you're trying to, uh, you know, build up muscles and bulk up and things like that, or in certain situations where, uh, you know, you're lactating or there's a pregnancy related or elderly patients who are sarcopenic. In certain conditions, yes, you may have to step up the protein, but not as a general rule. It is a lot is driven by the uh, industry and uh, all newer products which are coming are all labeled with extra protein, extra protein. In fact, studies have found that anything which is labeled with extra protein tends to get sold faster because that is the whole mindset which has uh, come up. 
uh, what i would like to share here is that you know in trying to look at individual components we are kind of forgetting to look at the package that comes through us while even if when we are looking at uh, proteins uh, we need to look at the package which is coming uh, i would just like to share my screen if it is okay uh, can somebody stop the screen sharing uh, screen sharing right now and uh, uh, so when you when you're talking of uh, Yeah, so when you look at the package, when proteins can be got from animal sources or they can be obtained from plant sources. We just talked about soy and how a good source of protein it is. If you compare the two, definitely you will have more protein content in animal uh, products as compared to most of the plant products. But what also comes along with it is saturated fats, cholesterol, TMAO, hydrocyclic amines, heme ion, neophygc, endotoxins, hormones, antibiotics, and a deranged gut bacteria. On the other hand, on plant-based food, you have so many beneficial things that come along with it. So if you look at the combination, you are not isolating, you're eating food. You're not eating just proteins, you're eating food. So what food you eat plays a big role. And many of these uh, you know, uh, products that come along with animal proteins are toxic and inflammatory products. Now, heme ion has been shown to be associated with an increased risk of colon cancer, apart from having uh, risks of inflammation, vascular dysfunction, myocardial damage. Uh, just cooking meat and fish releases heterocyclic amines, and they are known to be neurotoxic, myocardial toxic, and increase the risk of diabetes and are even carcinogenic. Right? Preserving these animal products leads to production of nitrosamines. Right? And these are also known to be carcinogenic and teratogenic. Digestion of meat and fish in a, without doing anything releases what is known as TMAO. And the animal industry is now desperately trying to find ways how to hide this fact. But it is clearly shown that this has an increased risk of mortality. Neo5GC is another product which is found in animal foods alone. And it increases inflammation, causes atherosclerosis and increases the risk of cancer. And there are more freebies that come with animal proteins. There's increased risk of pro prostate cancer, increased risk of colorectal cancer, damage to the vascu endothelial uh, vasculature and inflammation, and even cardiovascular diseases. Now, the new uh, you know, thinking is we, we are understanding more and more about this mTOR pathway, which I would like to touch upon uh, just briefly. What is this mTOR? Now, it is basically a protein kinase which is known as the master controller of protein synthesis, right? And to simplify things uh, very, uh, we're trying to make it very simple. If this mTOR activity in our body is increased, it promotes cell growth and causes proliferation, right? And that leads to diseases, including cancer. On the other hand, if this mTOR activity is reduced, it leads to repair and maintenance. The body goes into repair and maintenance mode which is known as autophagy. Now, autophagy is quite important. Why? Because it recycles the damaged proteins. We all know that the protein requirement that we talk of is just to replenish the unavoidable loss that goes through you know, uh, skin and hair and things like that. Most of the proteins are recycled in our body. And when this happens, in autophagy happens, what happens is the damaged organelles are removed and healthier tissue is generated. Right? This is basically an anti-aging process. And mTOR is considered to be the most potent repressor of autophagy. So we need to keep this mTOR activity low if we want to have longevity. And what increases mTOR? Glucose and amino acids. And what decreases mTOR is low GI foods and low protein. Basically, fasting is a good way. When you fast, the body goes into a survival mode. Or when you consume low proteins, the body goes into survival mode and that helps in repair and maintenance and autophagy. There are many diseases now which have been linked with excess of mTOR. Genetic diseases, neurodegenerative, memory loss, cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune, endocrine, metabolic, and even cancers and aging itself. Right? And if you look at animal foods, they are high in protein. They have all amino acids in plenty, which is 
the fact that you know uh, is being promoted that it's so called complete protein they have all amino acids in huge amounts but what this exactly does it increases the mTOR activity and leads to aging or even cancers on the other hand plant foods have balanced protein now remember plant foods also are complete in nature they also have all amino acids but few amino acids are restricted right so that in fact puts the body into survival mode and leads to autophagy and that causes decreased mTOR activity and gives rise to longevity thank you so much so what what the whole crux of the matter is that proteins are necessary up to a certain amount excess proteins are not going to give any additional benefit uh, certainly excess proteins are not going to help you build your body if you want to build your body you have to do it in the gym not in the kitchen so up to a limit yes and those who are deficient in protein definitely you need to reach the recommended allowances and if you have to take proteins definitely a plant based protein source is far better than an animal based protein source i hope that answers Thank most of the things yes sir now our uh, next question is for uh, dr pujam uh, unfortunately, uh, again, Dr. Woman is not uh, available because of unavoidable reasons, but she has uh, shared her uh, presentation. So we will uh, look into that. Now, ma'am, uh, Pooja, ma here is the question. There are studies that have suggested that the protein content of males may affect glucose homeostasis as well as insulin levels and sensitivity. Please briefly explain homeostasis, energy metabolism, and uh, satiety. Thank you for that question. And can you hear me? Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, ma'am. So, blood glucose homeostasis is the process of maintaining blood glucose at a, at a steady state. And uh, through the processes like uh, glucogenesis, glycogenolysis, and gluconeogenesis. Research shows that protein has a notable impact on glucose homeostasis mechanisms, predominantly through their effect on insulin, in cretin, uh, like GIP, GLP-1, uh, gluconeogenesis, and gastric emptying. Protein consumption is directly correlated with affluence, and incidentally, it's the same affluent demographic that the greatest incidences of diabetes, obesity, and related diseases can be typically seen. Therefore, a thorough understanding in the protein's role in glucose homeostasis is crucial both towards the prevention and management of impaired glucose tolerance and other non-communicable diseases. High protein diets have been shown to beneficially affect blood glucose, blood pressure, heart health, cardiovascular disease and cholesterol levels in the short term. And high protein meals have been indicated to have a greater thermic effect and increased energy expenditure than carbohydrates and fats which is almost 20 to 30%, meaning that uh, protein, uh, the thermic effect of feeding of protein is about 20 to 30%. Uh, like suppose if you take 25 grams of protein in a meal, it will give you around 100 calories because one gram of protein is uh, 4 calories, so around 100 calories. So in that 100, when you consume that 100 calorie of protein from, uh, uh, from protein, 20 to 30 calories will be uh, required for digestion and absorption of protein. So therefore, there is greater focus on proteins from a therapeutic perspective. Increased protein consumption has also been shown to be beneficial in weight loss and thus it has become the basis of popular weight loss regime. A large volume of research has shown that consuming proteins in combination with carbohydrates significantly alters glucose homeostasis mechanisms. It has been demonstrated that deaminated amino acids that is the carbon skeleton present in dietary proteins could be used to produce glucose endogenously, meaning that uh, protein molecule, it has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and it has nitrogen. So like all the macronutrients, the carb uh, carbohydrate, fat, and uh, protein, they all have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but protein in addition has nitrogen, which is 
toxic. So the body cannot store it like carbohydrate and fat. It has to clear that nitrogen out of the body. So protein, if in excess, cannot be stored in the body. It either has to convert to glucose to provide energy or it has to get converted to uh, fats and store in the adipose tissue. So protein is just the requirement that is, it, it is just for the cell turnover. And for most common proteins, 50 to 80 grams of glucose can be derived from 100 grams of ingested protein. Means when you, if you take 100 grams of uh, protein, uh, around 50 to 80 grams of glucose can be converted to glucose. Body proteins are being synthesized and degraded continuously. The estimated turnover, which is called the protein cell turnover, and the estimated turnover is around 200 grams per day. So in the fasted state, blood glucose homeostasis is maintained by the regulation of hepatic and renal glucose production. That is through gluconeogenesis. And one of the principal substrates for gluconeogenesis are amino acids. And uh, alanine, uh, the amino acid alanine has been shown to be the preferred substrate for gluconeogenesis. During fasting or intense exercise, muscle cells break down and release alanine, which is then transferred to liver through a transamination process. Then alanine is changed to pyruvate. And following the pyruvate, it gets converted to oxaloacetate. And then oxaloacetate enters the Krebs cycle and it can be converted to glucose to maintain the blood glucose levels. And uh, there are slides other... Slides are not visible. Slides are not visible. No, there are no slides actually. Uh... Okay, okay. So there are uh, also uh, many amino acids which are glucogenic, meaning they can produce glucose, like arginine, aspartame, aspartic acid, cysteine, glutamine, glycine, histidine, methionine, proline, serine, and valine. So they all are glucogenic amino acids. Only leucine and lysine are not, not glucogenic. They are ketogenic. So leucine is a part of the branch chain amino acids. Branch chain amino acids are supposed to be very anabolic. Uh, so there are three branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. These are anabolic, but at the same time, now the new data research uh, shows that it is also implicated in type 2 diabetes. So proteins and some amino acids have been shown to stimulate the secretion of both insulin and glucagon. So they secrete both insulin and glucagon. And uh, they have been shown to differentially affect incretin secretion, means like the GIP, GLP-1 and all. Proteins are believed to induce insulin secretion both by the direct stimulation of pancreatic beta cells by amino acids and via incretin hormones expressed in response to meal composition. The mechanisms by which amino acids stimulate insulin appear to be different to that of glucose. Circulating plasma amino acid levels also have effect on peripheral glucose uptake mechanisms. Increased plasma amino acid levels have been shown to induce skeletal muscle insulin resistance and reduce glycogen synthesis by stalling glucose transport and phosphorylation. So in one study with whey protein and beef ingestion, almost 500 grams of beef was given, it was seen that there was a sharp rise in plasma insulin levels. Different protein sources elicit different effects on insulin. A beef meal more than a cod fillet meal, cod fillet meal, like the fish meal, and uh, this is due to the differences in amino acid composition and protein digestibility. In, in a study, in uh, like there were 72 healthy, lean and obese men. They were given 50 grams of whey protein, soy protein and gluten and their uh, insulin was measured. Insulin, ghrelin, CCK, GLP-1, all was measured. And they found that all proteins equally suppressed ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone and the incretins like uh, the uh, GLP-1, CCK, but had different effects on insulin secretion. So they suppressed the hunger hormones and the um, incretins, but they had different uh, effects on insulin secretion. While all proteins failed to secrete insulin as much as glucose did, the lowest expression was observed for gluten, which is the wheat protein. A few studies have also looked at the effect of proteins in type 2 diabetics. A meal with glucose and cottage cheese resulted in a higher insulin response than a meal with other proteins such as fish or soy. So soy has been uh, uh, like it is supposed to be good for uh, glucose intolerance and it's also hypolipidemic. The major stimulus for insulin secretion was the increase in incretins that was stimulated in response to protein or its 
digestion products in the intestine, implying insulin response was related to protein digestion rate. In another study, 10 untreated type 2 diabetics were either given 50 grams of lean beef and water uh, and their insulin level was measured for subsequent 8 hours. They found that beef showed a threefold increase in insulin than water and it remained high, elevated for up to 7 hours. Leucine uh, plus glucose significantly upregulates insulin. So leucine is the branch chain amino acid and uh, it significantly upregulates insulin. Leucine is the only amino acid which stimulates insulin secretion in the absence of glucose. So all other amino acids, they need some glucose for the insulin secretion. But leucine, independent of the carbohydrate, it can uh, uh, stimulate secretion of, of glucose. A considerable number of studies have shown that two or more amino acids increase insulin secretion through synergy. So two or more amino acids that they are together, they uh, even raise the insulin more. Milk proteins have been shown to be more insulinogenic, particularly the whey fraction, which also induces a greater incretin response. Postprandial amino acid excursions have been shown to stimulate glucagon secretion independent of glycemic status. So, uh, like we'll see what are the effects of co-ingesting co proteins and carbohydrates on bl blood glucose and insulin. So protein sources when co-ingested with carbohydrate results in a reduced glycemic response and whey protein shows insulinotropic and glucose lowering effects. So when uh, in one study whey protein, um, 10 to 40 grams of whey protein was consumed before high carbohydrate meals and it was shown that blood glucose and insulin reduced in a dose dependent manner. So uh, uh, pre-protein, pre-meal protein, which is all the rage now like uh, uh, the protein is given before the high carbohydrate meal and then you do not see so much spike in the blood sugars. The blood sugar do not spike as much. Uh, is thought to be a useful strategy, the pre-meal protein ingestion for glucose, blood glucose control in healthy and diabetic individuals. But however, a 16-week randomized control trial in people with pre-diabetes found that consuming starchy carbohydrates last did not affect glucose tolerance, HbA1c or HOMA IR. So it doesn't, the short-term benefits doesn't translate to the long-term benefits. That is what this RCT shows. These studies collectively demonstrate the complexity of proteins effect on glucose homeostasis. There is very little data on the metabolic effects of dietary protein combination, both in diabetics and non-diabetics. The long-term effect of protein quality on glycemia and insulin secretion is also questionable. Also, some long-term high-protein diets, that is six months in duration, have shown to increase insulin resistance and lead to glucose intolerance. So, in the short term, everything looks good, but the long term is uh, slightly confusing and uh, controversial. Uh, so, this it was, it was shown that uh, more than six months, it produces insulin resistance and lead to glucose intolerance in healthy subjects and increase the long-term risk of type 2 diabetes. However, other long-term studies done in overweight, obese subjects have found improved glucose homeostasis. This may be partially due to weight loss. So about the protein and satiety, many studies report that eating more protein helps people feel fuller and naturally reduces their food intake. One randomized control trial compared diets with 5%, 15%, and 30% of the energy coming from the protein over a 12-day window. The highest protein group naturally reduced their calories the most. Some long-term clinical trials of 6 to 12 months have reported that a high protein diet provides weight loss effects and can prevent weight gain after weight loss. High protein diet increases the anorexigenic hormone levels while decreasing the hunger hormones like ghrelin, resulting in increased satiety signaling and eventually reduced food intake. So the short-term effect, uh, a diet with higher protein intake can increase satiety and reduce overall pro uh, calorie consumption. High protein intake enhances prandial insulin secretion, potentially improving glycemic control in individuals with type 2 diabetes. However, the long-term considerations, the diet high in protein has been associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. This paradoxical effect warrants further investigation. Also, the animal protein consumption seems to be related to an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, while plant protein are associated with a modestly reduced risk. Also, currently, there's no ideal uh, dietary composition that has been definitively established for preventing type 2 diabetes and related metabolic disorders. The advantage of plant protein sources may be due to their low glycemic index and high fiber content and the benefits associated with it. Branch chain amino acids 
like the leucine, isoleucine, and valine. They're the group of amino acids found and they are implicated in diabetes risk. However, research findings are not consistent and more studies are needed to clarify their role. So in summary, while protein intake can impact insulin sensitivity and glucose homeostasis, the optimal protein quality and quantity for diabetes prevention remain an area of ongoing research. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Vindya ma'am, can you please uh, share Uma ma'am's slide? Yes, Nefesh. Okay, thank you. Good evening. With them, I'm have you shared? Yeah, one second. Oh. Uh, Good evening and a warm welcome to each one of you. One second. Is it uh, seen? No, it is not visible. One second. Okay, now it is visible. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening and a warm welcome to each one of you. Um, it is with great pleasure that I address you today. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to PAN team for affording me this platform to share my thoughts and uh, insights. First and foremost, I must express my sincere apologies for not able to join virtually due to an unforeseen commitment. However, um, I'm truly grateful for this opportunity to present via this recording and be a part of this gathering in spirit. As we embark on this journey of knowledge and exchange, I'm excited to be among such esteemed um, speakers and participants. Each of us bring a unique perspective and expertise to the table, and I'm certain that today's discussion will be both enriching and enlightening. Should you have any questions or wish to go deeper into the topic I'm discussing today, please feel free to reach out to me via email and I welcome the opportunity to engage with you further in this regard. So let's go into the topic directly. The so question asked was, what is the effect of protein on glucose homeostasis, energy metabolism and satiety? So I want to start with saying protein is an essential macronutrient that plays a key role in various biological processes such as you know tissue synthesis, enzyme production, hormone regulation, all of this, and immune function as well. So protein also influences uh, glucose homeostasis in a variety of ways. Let's talk about that. So when I say glucose homeostasis, it really refers to the balance between the glucose production and the utilization of glucose in the body which is really regulated by hormones such as insulin and glucagon. So how does protein influence all of this? So let's start this into three separate sections. One, uh, protein increases um, or increases the stimulation of insulin secretion. So how does it do that? Proteins are broken down into amino acids during digestion, as we know. So some amino acids, especially the branched chain amino acids, like leucine, isoleucine, valine, they stimulate um, insulin secretion from the pancreas. Insulin helps facilitate the uptake of glucose into the cells, as we know, promoting its storage as glycogen in the liver and muscle for uh, utilization for energy. While insulin response to protein is lower compared to the carbs, it is still con contributes. It is still contributing to the glucose clearance from the bloodstream, thereby helping in maintenance of the glucose levels, blood glucose levels. This mechanism is particularly um, relevant in postprandial, that is after meal periods, where the rise in the blood glucose level triggers insulin release to promote glucose uptake by tissues. Second way is amino acid contribution to gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is nothing but it's a 
metabolic pathway that occurs primarily in the liver and uh, to a lesser, lesser extent in the kidneys. So during this process, certain amino acids like alanine, glutamine, serine, they can, they can serve as precursors for glucose synthesis, meaning that even if you are um, taking like carb-restricted diet, you can still have glucose in your body by means of these amino acids. For example, like alanine, which is released um, from muscle tissue during periods of increased energy demand or low blood glucose levels. Other thing is glutamine is another amino acid that can contribute to the production of glucose, particularly during fasting or low carb intake when glucose availability is limited in the body. So thereby we are providing substrates for the production of glucose um, by having protein intake, which really helps to maintain the blood glucose levels within a normal range, especially during prolonged periods of fasting or uh, carb restriction. And how does uh, glucose affect the insulin sensitivity? So some studies have suggested that higher protein diets may improve insulin sensitivity, potentially reducing the risk of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Protein-rich foods have lower glycemic index compared to high-carb foods, right? So this leads to a slower and more gradual increase in uh, blood glucose level after consumption instead of having a quick spike in the um, blood glucose levels. So additionally, protein intake has been associated with increased amount of insulin sensitizing hormones such as adiponectin, which enhances the insulin action in the peripheral tissues. So the combination of all these factors um, contribute improved glucose homeostasis, meaning balance, and reduce the risk of uh, high glucose and insulin resistance. So that's how protein play a vital role in maintaining the normal blood glucose levels. Second thing is um, the question asked was, how does protein influence the energy metabolism? So what is energy metabolism? This refers to the process of converting any food that we eat into energy and using that energy for various cell functions in the body, right? So protein intake can affect this energy metabolism by influencing the energy intake, energy expenditure, and the balance. So the important fact here is protein has high thermic effect of food, which we call it as TEF. So this higher thermic effect of food compared to carb and fat, meaning that more energy is expended or used during the digestion and metabolism of protein-rich meals. This increased energy expenditure can contribute to overall energy balance and weight management. Um, so talking about the thermic effect of food, so protein has the highest thermic effect of food among the other macronutrients estimated to be around 20 to 30 percent of the energy content of the protein consumed compared to only 5 to 10 percent of the carbs or 0 to 3 percent for fats. So this higher atomic effect of protein means that this energy is used during the process of protein-rich meals contributing to overall energy expenditure. This increased energy expenditure can have implications for weight management as it may contribute to greater, all, greater uh, overall energy deficit when combined with reduced calorie intake. I hope uh, you get the point here. Uh, lean body mass synthesis and maintenance is also uh, influenced by protein. So protein is essential for the synthesis of uh, synthesis and maintenance of lean body mass, which includes your muscle tissue, organs, and other metabolically active tissues. So muscle tissue is particularly important for energy metabolism as it contributes uh, significantly to the basic metabolic rate, which is the energy expended by the body at rest um, to maintain the basic physiological functions. Protein provides the amino acids necessary for muscle uh, protein synthesis, repair and remodeling, especially during the period of exercise and resistance training. So adequate protein intake, along with regular physical activity, helps to preserve the lean body mass during weight loss or calorie restriction, preventing excessive loss of muscle tissue and helping uh, to maintain the metabolic rate. 
So uh, when we talk about metabolic rate, um, this basic metabolic rate that we call BMR accounts for the majority of the total energy expenditure, and it is influenced by a variety of factors such as your body composition, age, gender, and hormonal status. So the lean body mass, primarily composed of protein-rich um, tissues like muscle, cont uh, contributes significantly to the basic metabolic rate. So by supporting the maintenance of lean body mass, protein intake helps to preserve or even increase the basic metabolic rate, thereby contributing um, to overall energy expenditure. Um, additionally, protein's role in muscle repair and recovery following exercises can directly, uh, sorry, can indirectly influence energy expenditure by enabling more intense or frequent workouts, leading to greater energy expenditure during physical activity. So that's how protein influences the energy metabolism. And lastly, uh, the question about protein and satiety. So satiety is uh, definition refers to the feeling of fullness and satisfaction after eating, which influences subsequent food intake and appetite regulation. This is really important. Satiety is the feeling of that fullness after we eat any meal. And protein intake can affect satiety by stimulating the release of sat uh, satiety hormones such as um, cholecystokinin, um, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide-1, and peptide-YY, and by inhibiting the release of the hunger hormones we call such as ghrelin. So protein intake can also affect satiety by modulating the activity of brain regions involved in the reward and the hedonic response to food, such as um, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens. So these are the parts in the brain that really give you the sensation of reward um, when we eat a food. So, and protein has a greater influence um, in modulating the activity of these brain centers. Several studies have shown that protein-rich meals can increase your feeling of fullness and reduce the hunger. And this is so true. If you eat a cup full of lentils, your satiety level is really high that you can maintain your uh, um, craving for next meal for a very longer time. Um, and uh, it not only reduces the hunger, the protein intake also decreases the subsequent food intake compared to lower protein meals. Um, for example, a, a meta-analysis um, showed that the protein intake increased the satiety by 25% reduced hunger by 19% and decreased the subsequent volume of food intake by 12% compared to the carb intake. So protein intake also reduced the desire to eat and uh, the preference for high fat food and high sugar foods. This is very interesting. Um, so the, the choice of food that you take after a good protein meal is also different. Um, based on the current evidence and some practical recommendations, uh, for protein intake and satiety, or I would highly recommend using, um, you know, high quality protein foods, um, as we discussed in our previous discussions, like legumes, nuts, seeds, uh, they increase the feeling of fullness and reduce the need for, um, you know, frequent snacking. So consume protein rich foods that really have a high sensory appeal and to increase the pleasure and satisfaction derived from eating and to reduce the craving for other uh, you know, unhealthy foods. Um, protein um, rich foods that have low energy density, such as like vegetables, fruits, soups, salads, and to increase the volume and the weight of the food intake and also the, uh, reduce the total energy intake. Um, and then protein-rich foods um, that have high fiber and water content, such as beans, lentils, oats, and berries, um, to increase that uh, distension of the gastric mucosa and uh, intestines, uh, transit time, so that there is a delay in the gastric emptying and absorption of the nutrients. So these are the major factors that really help um, in you know, considering the protein-rich foods. So as we discussed here, protein has a huge role in maintaining the normal blood glucose levels and maintaining the energy metabolism and also giving you that uh, healthy satiety. Um, so I really wish um, each one of you best um, in taking that right choice, in picking the right foods. 
um, and uh, definitely um, get back to me if you have any questions on this topic. Once again, I extend my sincere thanks to Pan for this wonderful opportunity and to all of you for uh, your time and attention um, until this time. Take care and thank you. Thank uh, It was a good talk from uh, Dr. Uma Man. Okay, the next question goes to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Akiran Man. Uh, a low protein diet is often recommended for the manage management of patients with kidney diseases. What is the recommended daily protein intake for pro uh, patients with impaired kidney function and how much protein is considered high intake in this context? Also, how does a high protein diet affect renal function and what are the advantages of a low protein diet for people with kidney diseases? How can someone with impaired kidney function follow the suggested in nutritional intake? Kiranma? Yes, hello. Okay. Good evening, one and all. I think I'm having some problem with the connectivity. I'll try to go into video mode, but uh, am I clearly audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Okay, let me see if I can continue on the video mode. Otherwise, I'll go back to on the audio. In between, I was logged out of Zoom twice. So I do not want to take that risk anymore. Okay, so... Uh, can I share the screen, Vindya? Yes, ma'am. Just give me a second. Okay. Now you can share. Yes, yes, I'll do that. Oh, it's not allowing me to go to my desktop. Ma'am, you can uh, op open the page. Yes, it is It is open on my desktop. Yeah, and uh, uh, come back to Zoom and uh, do this uh, slide sharing. Um, yeah, screen. Shall I close and open it again? Okay, ma'am. Try, try it. I'll, I'll try to do that. Please minimize it rather than closing it. You can minimize it. Okay, let me see. Try pressing escape or the windows key. Sorry, sorry. Press I the windows it. key. No, I got it on my thing. I'll do that. Just let me know if it is now seen. Have I shared my screen? Can you see that? We can see. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can I see? Yes. Okay. So I have tried to put it as few uh, in this outline, <clears throat> I'll try to define a few relevant terms so that we are on the same page. Uh, we'll try to answer does protein intake lead to impaired kidney function and the other way around protein intake to improve kidney function, the dietary proteins and progression of renal disease, quantity and quality of proteins matter. We'll try to just go through a few common specific diseases and see how we can manage protein intake in these. What are the general recommended guidelines? Let me tell you, on the whole, the 
recommendations are similar <clears throat> except in a few conditions where there are still many controversies and conflicting uh, study results okay so ckd there are five stages and ckd means either kidney damage or decline in renal function okay uh -huh. as determined by gfr for three or more months and this is an independent risk factor for both cvd and all cause mortality hypertension is the second leading cause of ckd and accounts for almost 30% in all cases of ckd in us high protein diets are generally defined as a daily consumption of 1.5 gram or more per kg per day and this is almost twice the current rda but within dris the institute of medicine dri report concluded insufficient evidence for recommendation of an upper limit of protein intake but suggested more than suggesting an upper limit in grams per kg it suggests an acceptable macronutrient distribution range of 10 to 35% of total energy for protein intake everything fine going till now the slides are moving i am audible just confirming show me your hand any one of you okay great so high protein diet is something which is more than 1.2 gram per kg body weight per day this we are saying in impaired kidney function induces significant alterations in renal function and kidney health it modulates renal dynamics so i'll tell you something just to know the common baseline that we will be going through is increased protein intake leads to increase renal blood flow and intraglomerular pressure which in turn results in higher gfr and more efficiency efficient excretion of protein derived nitrogenous waste with an increase in volume and weight so this is referred to as glomerular hyperfiltration this for a short while as it happens during gestation period is okay and they have seen both in gestation and animal studies that this increased glomerular hyperfiltration can come back to its original thing if it is for a short while but we are not able to say that if it is the same situation in contemporary high protein diets being taken for weight management so dietary protein and progression of renal disease is it what is low protein diet and is it beneficial we'll go to next we are still looking at high protein in otherwise normal individuals with no renal dysfunction so nurses health study over a period of 11 years has shown that protein intake compared to the change in egfr over 11 years if there is pre existing renal disease association is there but no such association in another cohort with normal renal function so johnson et al protein intake as a possible risk factor for remaining uh, renal function in diet <coughs> sorry protein is definitely a possible risk factor for the remaining renal function in dialysis patients <coughs> but for practice guidelines definitely reduce dietary protein intake in chronic renal diseases with proteinuria that statement is very clear <coughs> if there is proteinuria you have to reduce dietary protein intake <coughs> sorry in contrast to what usually feel people feel proteinuria is there so the person is losing proteins in urine so compensate it with increased dietary protein intake which is totally a hazardous uh, conclusion but 
at the same time it is also important that these recommendations of low protein intake in the diet are not for persons with normal kidney function or as a prevention strategy to avoid developing ckd benefits of having low protein thing in ckd low protein diet is something which is 0.6 to 0.8 gram per kg benefits as we saw before it definitely decreases the glomerular hyperfiltration protein urea and uremic toxins the load being presented to the kidney from protein is less so there is less of uremic toxin it decreases oxidative stress metabolic acidosis and phosphorus load decreases insulin resistance and bp leading to better uremia control and most important they keep insisting on this point is delay in dialysis initiation but again that contradictory or conflict comes if there is inadequate caloric intake if you are reducing protein <clears throat> to less than 30 g per kg per day you will have protein loss hypercatabolism inflammation worsening acidemia altered glucose homeostasis and protein energy wasting worsening the clinical outcomes but this is a very big question mark not many studies have corroborated on this point most of them go by that lpd if you are constantly checking their caloric intake we know that urinary protein is a surrogate marker of progression of ckd it increases with damages in podocytes and proximal tubular cells so any proteinuria by itself induces apoptosis of renal tubules and impairs the podocytes regeneration resulting in tubular atrophy and progressive renal failure so protein restriction has been shown to lower proteinuria by 20 to 50% in ckd and this has a linear relationship we'll see another interesting point now <clears throat> low protein diet results in vasoconstrictive effect at afferent arterioles while renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibition if you give them this treatment it decreases efferent resistance so a combined treatment with lpd and ras blockade to achieve lower urinary proteinuria and further risk of ckd progression <clears throat> in a few cases especially in cystic kidney diseases or hypertension decreasing salt intake along with the protein is another good reno protective effect very low vegetarian protein diet as low as 0.3 g per kg per day supplemented with keto analogs mitigated clinic kidney function decline and reduced renal replacement therapy need renal replacement therapy need will take it more often as initiation of dialysis here so conservative treatment with lpd in end stage renal disease <clears throat> low protein diet can be used effectively to delay initiation of dialysis therapy as i said there is more and more focus on delaying the dialysis initiation of dialysis to the most that you can so this delay with vitamins and keto analogs by a mean of 10.7 months with no conse negative consequences besides giving financial benefits and less of hospitalization it also saves time for maturation of av fistula and avoids insertion of central venous catheter plus incremental transition to dialysis is also delayed like more frequent dialysis per week delaying uh, decreasing frequency of hospitalization dose of erythropoietin and phosphorus binder so these are all the benefits that we get by delay in the initiation of 
dialysis. However, conflicting results again with that same risk of malnutrition and challenge of adherence. <clears throat> and more so, this benefit of LPD has not been confirmed in diabetes kidney diseases. These are the references. In hypertensive nephropathy, most of the principles that we saw before apply specifically to hypertensive nephropathy, 0.6 to 0.7 gram per kg. Uh, much less is known about the effect of protein intake in hypertensive patients without chronic kidney disease. In fact, there it is suggested that a normal to high protein intake is associated with a better outcome in a subset of population, specifically those who are younger with low salt intake without aortic atherosclerosis or previous cardiovascular events. It's only in this particular cohort with these pre-existing uh, good conditions can you think of normal to high protein intake. Otherwise, it is the low protein diet. Protein intake may also be associated with cardiovascular events with a high consumption associated with a protective effect against stroke in the general female population. This is again for the higher protein intake subset. So it is protective effect against stroke in the general female population. Relationship between dietary protein and its effect on the development of salt-sensitive hypertension and renal injury. This is another thing that they have come up with. Over 15 years study, they have demonstrated that both the source and amount of dietary protein. It's not just the amount. They are now focusing on the source also can influence the severity of diseases because mechanisms are related to immunity, the maternal environment during pregnancy, and the gut microbiota. So uh, we will see more regarding this with related to systemic hypertension in another subset. So diabetes kidney diseases is the leading cause of end-stage renal disease in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Managements include control of BSL only just focusing on the proteins may not be a good uh, uh, strategy. Control the BSL, lipids, BP, BMI with diet and also activity. Both quantity and quality of protein and amino acids are important. Challenges in DKD are metabolic abnormalities, including mineral metabolism, metabolic acidosis, vitamin D deficiency, loss of lean muscle mass, and susceptibility to malnutrition. Many research studies, all taking in different focuses with conflicting results. In general, it should be focused. I understand this is only protein in a particular kidney disease, but at least in a few conditions, you cannot focus only on the protein. So achieve a healthy weight, choose low fat dairy products, or preferably later they say a vegan diet also. Include these oils, MUFAs, avoid high intakes of saturated and trans fats, work toward a sodium intake of less than 2,300, preferably 1,500. Enjoy fruits and vegetables servings four to six per day. Monitoring serum potassium and also uh, be in touch with your dietitian and doctor. Include whole grains. We'll see more about this whole grains also. Just recall we said about gut microbiota also affecting the thing. So whole grains and monitor potassium and phosphorus for sure, include lean proteins, preferably consider incorporating plant protein and keep protein to less than 0.8 gram, eat more calories from complex carbs than from fatty animal protein food sources or from refined sugar food sources, exercise daily. 
some studies suggested a beneficial effect of plant based protein source though the mechanism is not clear many hypotheses have been postulated that it is the amino acid composition the carb sources fatty acid intake the total calories percentage of calories from each macronutrient as dr sharang said it's the full food package that matters and not just the macronutrient from which you are taking <clears throat> so taking plant based protein also enhances intake of antioxidants phytonutrients and most importantly decreased phosphate intake levels which is the most toxic element now they say the other indefined undefined interactions of which probably we are not yet aware of or not working towards it there are as i said many organizations many recommendations suffice to say a few say limited to 0.8 gram kg per day for people with dkd stages of 1 to 4 so anything before end stage renal diseases is limited to 0.8 gram kg per day <clears throat> and for end stage when it is less than 30 though one institution says it is still at 0.8 with appropriate ed education others say restrict it go below 0.8 if it is less than 30 ml you need to avoid it and uh, avoidance of high levels of protein intake are defined as more than 20% of calories from protein remember we said focus more on the calories from proteins that you are taking coming to polycystic kidney disease we'll just discuss a few interesting things that will apply to hypertension also this is inherited or acquired we are looking only on inherited the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease leads to common complications of hypertension systemic predisposing to cvds and cystic formation in other organs including the liver the more sinister variety is the autosomal recessive one where it is pulmonary hypoplasia that is very common and responsible for early death the survivors go in for systemic or portal hypertension and renal dysfunction so the three main points to recall or the key messages here are patients with polycystic kidney disease can be advised to stick to a low protein diet patients with pkd protein restriction should accompany receiving adequate calories remember we've been saying if you restrict calories then you are going into a negative metabolism or protein catabolism and risking a malnutrition there is need for additional research to explore the benefits of plant proteins especially soy in these patients they have found till now very good results but the studies have included a lesser number of people and they want to say that more research is needed in this nephrotic syndrome optimal dietary protein intake is 1 to 1.1 kg this is more i am discussing in children and 0.8 kg per day in other types of nephrotic syndrome except that minimal change nephrotic syndrome additional protein restriction is required for patients with renal dysfunction higher protein intake is it beneficial as i was just saying a little while ago we think ki urinary protein losses let us compromise or compensate with the increased urine uh, protein intake but this there is no net gain of protein the increased urinary protein is lost in the urine plus any protein urea by itself can cause renal damage it leads to changes in glomerular hemodynamics that may accelerate the progress of renal disease protein restriction can positively impact kidney function in adults adults with a decreased renal function 
but a very low protein diet be avoided again because of malnutrition daily protein intake is similar to recommended protein intake for the general pediatric population if there is no kidney dysfunction vegetable resources of protein preferred whenever possible everywhere this is being focused upon because it gets along the many other free bonus points in a package special diets in nephrotic syndrome there has been a successful attempt of treating with hypoallergenic sorry hypoallergenic diets which we refer to as elimination diets may modulate composition and immune function of gut microbiota lowering the risk of immune mediated responses in nephrotic syndrome milk chicken egg white gluten wheat flour pork beef are to be avoided include whole grains for the same reason because you will be now giving them good source for microbiota gluten free diet may stabilize the podocyte cytoskeleton and modify the gut microbiota reducing release of inflammatory mediators and leading to which will otherwise lead to glomerulate glomerular permeability to proteins special diets successful treatment with hypoallergenic diets they have found soy based vegetarian diet reinforcing what dr sharan had initially mentioned it decreases the serum cholesterol the high hallmark of nephrotic syndrome of increased lipids there so it decreases serum cholesterol apolipoprotein and also proteinuria and the isoflavones reduce the glomerular damage vegan diet improves hyperlipidemic state preventing progression of kidney damage but of course we should remember that vegan diet needs a few micronutrient supplementation which should not be forgotten especially the b12 and other b factors there is another interesting thing which now the uh, contemporary medicine has started adopting in persian medicine pomegranate and a fruit called quince is rich in flavonoids and antioxidants and has been found to improve glomerular dysfunction decreases urinary protein excretion reduces concentration of renin angiotensin thus lowering systolic bp this is the reference i found this is stages of ckd and i think i have come to the end of my presentation thank you thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to share and let me tell you this has been a wonderful opportunity for me to go through this material and learn also so i have always firmly believe teaching is the best form of learning which i do when i present things here thank you once again thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am for such an insightful uh, discussion uh, now we would like to open the floor for uh, questions from audience uh you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, directly ask question to speakers or uh, you can also post your question in chat box uh, i'm just looking at some of the questions in the chat box which form of protein is better soy or whey i think that has been answered uh, quite well that uh, certainly better to avoid whey protein and go for soy protein uh, soy products like chunks or granules so you should try and stay as close to the minimal processing which is required uh, there are a lot of factors in nutrition that we still don't know and we are still learning so any amount of processing is going to remove a lot of factors uh from it so uh, try to eat foods as whole as possible and that will definitely give uh, more information a uh, more uh, benefit thank you sir so there is one more question regarding the guideline for district from uh, parmitpur uh, 
uh, guidelines for distributing protein in the three major and the three meals. I think three major uh, meals and the uh, three snacks in a day or three meals in a day. If recommended, intake is sixty gram in a day. Uh, I don't think there is any uh, recommendation as far as this is concerned. As long as you get those uh, sixty grams in the day, whichever meal is okay. Uh, personally, I feel three major and three snacks in itself is a a huge amount of eating uh, the less we eat is the better it is so uh, we should try and keep the eating interval as short as possible rather than spread it out throughout the day so i don't think there is any uh, specific guideline for distribution of this protein intake uh, can i add a thing <clears throat> yeah please yes uh, in fact i tell my uh, participants that keeping the gate of the mouth closed to the maximum period as possible is the reason, uh, way of getting down your fasting insulin levels so don't keep on eating throughout the day or even if you are eating in a restricted time supposing you are fasting for 16 hours yet eating frequently you will not get the <clears throat> full benefit because every time you eat you are whipping your pancreas to give you more insulin whatever amount or whatever quality of food that you eat so restrict the number of feeds that you have secondly there was a time when we would say if you are plant source proteins are incomplete the grains and legumes come sort of uh, complement each other so you should have them at the same time but the recent recommendations or guidelines are you need not do that so that question of distributing it through the day is not any more matlab it does not have any meaning or significance because you can eat something at a time and another but focus on having at least five servings of fruits and vegetables and 60 grams of course is the upper limit you may be needing less of it based on your weight so you can have it any time of the day in any of the meals thank you ma'am uh achutan sir would you like to add something to this answer hello uh okay so we have one more question that can we have the rda for various diseases and uh, age group in a tabular form kiran uh, ma'am would you answer this question see whatever i have seen it's mainly in the form of 0.6 0.7 or 0.8 gram per kg per day and very low protein diet especially in end stage renal disease is 0.3 g per kg per day so i think that's what i found and let's not go into details and make things complex for us so stages 1 to 4 it is 0.6 to 0.7 depending on how it is the second thing is end stage renal disease you go for very low protein diet that is 0.3 g per kg with of course keto analogs and vitamins okay thank you ma'am uh, to dr divya malu uh, i will say that uh, we will uh, come up uh, we will try to come up with uh, the um, this uh, table of form uh, what uh, kiran ma'am has uh, su uh, suggested us uh, right now and uh, we are also uh, like to inform you that um, 
the currently fan india is uh, working on um, forming the uh, various uh, guidelines and uh, come up with a uh, um, more composed form of uh, nutritional uh, information for the so in uh, nature you will uh, get uh, some more uh, just a minute. I think your bandwidth is low. So if you switch off your uh, video, we can hear you better. Otherwise, there is a voice break when you are speaking. Okay. Uh, am I audible now? It's perfect. Hello? Okay. Uh, I was just saying that uh, currently Pan India is uh, working on forming um, uh, more refined uh, information, compiling more refined information uh, on various diseases and uh, uh, role of nutrition in those conditions. So in near future, we will definitely come with uh, the these uh, guidelines and uh, uh, tabular forms and like that. So just. Uh, uh, Please uh, tune for uh, it. Uh, that's what I was. That tabular form will be more helpful if it does not focus on individual component of nutrition. So, of course, after we finish yeah. all these discussion forums, you can go in for all macronutrients and micronutrients, RDAs or DRIs, and then that may be more fruitful for as a reference material for us. Yes, ma'am. Any more questions? If there is uh, no more question, then I request uh, Dishna, ma'am, to continue uh, to conclude this uh, discussion and uh, continue. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, Hi, this I is Deshna. Uh, one second. Just, I think there is one question. Yep. No, you can continue. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Deshna Oswal. And uh, the session was really wonderful. I've got a lot of pages of. Uh, uh, what I learned was, uh, what I can make it a, a gist of this session was, so I started with soy. Soy as a protein is a best uh, on diabetes, hypertension, heart health, bone health. It decreases the risk of breast cancer, etc. Your... Oh, Absorption, one of the points was... is getting cracked. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, hello? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in case of calcium absorption, it was uh, said that it is a uh, comparable to milk in in case of soya. Next point, which was highlighted, was phytoestrogen. Uh, it can attach to both the sites, but it usually uh, attaches to ER beta, and uh, a single serving of of 25 mg of isoflavin 50 sorry 50 grams per day of soy protein or 50 mg of isoflavin per day can be uh, is recommended on a daily basis other than that highlighted as uh, saying the impact of mTOR on uh, uh, increased risk of diseases when the mTOR was increased and plant protein plant protein in the case of plant protein it is a Balanced protein and it has reduced mTOR and uh, thus uh, eventually uh, can prevent or reduce the risk of disease. Another thing was protein, uh, the role of protein in insulin uh, increased protein can improve glucose control, heart health, etc. But the highlight point was it was for only short term. Short term, high protein intake can improve all these conditions. And protein turnover uh, on a daily basis is around 200 grams per day on a daily basis. Uh, then uh, regarding 
protein other than that protein helps to preserve bmr it uh, it uh, increase the release of satiety hormones and it inhibits the release of hunger, hunger hormones it reduces the need of frequent uh, snacking that is specifically high fat food high uh, sugar rich food then dr kiran dr kiran described and it she elaborated on many uh, diseases kidney diseases and the role of protein in such diseases the uh, the highlight point i noted down was the protein intake it should be 10 to 35% of the total uh, energy intake and in case uh, if there is protein urea uh, the dietary protein should be decreased so uh, and both the source and amount of protein influences the severity of any disease that is very important and she mentioned that we should focus more on the percentage of protein from the total calories protein restric restriction should accompany receiving adequate adequate calorie intake to avoid malnutrition which is very co uh, common as people restrict protein along with uh, the restriction of calories and that can lead to malnutrition so we need to keep a note of it and vegetable protein source should be preferred and lastly she highlighted about the gut microbiota playing an important role in renal functions so i think uh, that makes it up all and uh, with that i would like to extend uh, i would li I like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to each of you for joining us today at the discussion forum on proteins everyone's active participation and insightful contribution have made this event truly enriching and valuable i would also like to express my gratitude to our esteemed speakers for sharing their expertise and knowledge enlightening us with the latest advancements and research in the field of protein nutrition last but not the least a big thank you to pan india for organizing this discussion forum and this being the uh, second part of protein uh, and dead and for their hard work and the people and the, my colleagues for their hard work and dedication in putting together this event and uh, this has been a great success thank you once again to everyone let's continue to promote awareness and understanding the, the importance of nutrition in our daily basis daily life thank you so much thank you thank you everyone thanks to